and then oh oh here come our attendees i see Hi, Gretchen. We we like you're out in the snow. It's yeah. yeah. I thought I, you know, I don't know. Maybe I should put up a background of Glimmer Glass. I actually it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. Very good to see you. And uh, glad we get to good winter. Yeah, and you? It's okay. 
But you've been doing a lot of like travels for your film, like, uh, or you can't, I'm, you're doing a lot of virtual travels. I'm doing tons of virtual. And of course, this is February. We're coming up on February, so it's Black History Month. So yeah, the, it's gonna be a busy month. That's fantastic. Yeah, we're doing a, a big Black History celebration in music at, in DC at WNO. Well, that's great. Um, so you do get to get out of town a little bit. Well, I'm still doing a lot of my work there virtually, actually. Um, I am going down there next week, but uh, a lot of it I just do from here. Uh, so. Washington is interesting now. Washington is scary in some I ways. Know. I mean, it's it's good now. I mean, last week was... Uh, I had one staff member there who he lives right near the Capitol. And the day after, you know, January 6th, the FBI was pounding on his door. It wow. turns out he lives in a building. There are three apartments and the other two apartments were full of people who had rented them as Airbnbs and had oh. trashed, trashed them completely. Oh. And then were, you know, insurgents on the Capitol. Oh, great. Great. So, you know, so, and he was like, he's, he's, he, you know, he's this very meek young man. And he was like, I can't believe that was happening in my building. You know, there's just three apartments. And so he was pretty upset, of course. Um, I mean, we're all upset, scary. but. I thought it was very scary. Wow. It looked, it looked absolutely frightening. I was very glad I was here that day and watching yeah. it almost on TV. It probably was scarier because there were so many, so many close ups and so, you know. Well, and, and you know, if they had all been black, they'd all be dead now. Well, <laughs> and <laughs> that's that's exactly right. Um, it just, I guess, I just read that there was one guy from Utica who was there. Oh, really? Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, there was a guy from Richfield Springs who really? put his name, who put his picture up on Facebook, and then took it down. So I'm hoping they're going to get him. Oh, oh dear. Well, one reason why we need to have this series, I, I guess, and, and maybe with that, we should get started. It's just a little bit past seven. Okay, and great. I see we've got uh, 31 attendees signed in. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe there's a few people that will be joining us over the next few minutes. Um, but good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, welcome to the fifth in a series of panel discussions that we've been having called Looking in the Mirror, Cooperstown Reflects on Racism. And today's focus is on arts and monuments. My name is Namita Sugandi, and I'm an assistant professor in the anthropology department at Hartwick College. Um, and I have the honor and, and privilege of co-moderating these sessions. So thank you again uh, for joining us today. Um, very quickly, um, you know, I just want to tell you a little bit about our series. So our panel discussion has been developed, these, these have been developed in response to the murder of George Floyd and the nationwide protests that erupted in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. So the goals of our series are to examine the, the way that racism impacts our community and our institutions, uh, to learn how we can confront bias and inequities at a local level, uh, to identify actions that we can take as individuals, groups, and as a community to address racism and create a more equitable Cooperstown. And we had uh, four panel discussions in the fall. I hope some of you were able to join us for those. Uh, today's panel kicks off our winter series and will be followed by two more sessions. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, so before we get started with today's discussions, oh, here's our reminder for those panels. I just wanted to go over a, a, a few logistics and, and talk a little bit about the format of our panel discussion. So I'm gonna start off with a few brief messages from our sponsors, um, introduce our, our, our panelists and my co-moderator. Um, after those introductions, we'll start with the presentations from our uh, panelists. So what we've asked each of them to have a, a, a short five to seven minute presentation presentation prepared for that. And if anybody has presentation specific questions, uh, you know, that are specific to a panelist, um, we can address them after those presentations. Um, we'll also have a, an, a question and answer session after all four of our speakers have had a chance to speak. Um, and right now, again, it looks like there's about 40 people signed in. So um, hopefully we'll have a chance to 
uh, to get to everybody's questions. So you'll see at the bottom of your um, uh, of your Zoom panel, uh, you should see uh, uh, this um, this this bar with a few icons. Um, so you'll note that the chat is disabled, um, so, and we're not going to be using the raise hand feature. That is also disabled. But you will see the question and answer tool is there, and that is where if you have any questions or any comments that you would like. Uh, one of the panelists to address, you can click on that and send that in during our discussion. Um, and again, if your question is specific to one of the panelists, well, you can you can mention that in the question, and we can direct it to to them. Otherwise, um, we'll sort of be uh, we'll sort of save everything and, and direct it to everybody. Um, so my co-host Molly will be moderating the question and answer tool and, and asking the questions on your behalf. Um, so we're going to do our best to get to everybody's questions, but obviously um, if we run out of time, we may not be able to get to everybody. So we, 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 we will do our best, um, but they will be seen and they will be things that um, we'll all be able to think about. So please do uh, feel free to share your questions and comments with that function. And then finally, um, just to let you guys guys know uh, that this, this panel discussion is being recorded and there will be a link to this recording made available on the Friends of the Village Library web, web page, um, which uh, we will uh, provide some links to that as well. So now a brief message from our, our organizers of the panel discussion, the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown. Um, the Friends of the Village Library works closely with the library uh, to work on issues of fundraising and to sponsor educational and entertaining programs for the Cooperstown community. Um, you can also find links to uh, resources to learn more about racism and how to address it. We've, we've had people from um, the library and volunteers start adding some materials on there now, so you can check those out as well. Um, Foval is also very grateful to the League of Women Voters of Cooperstown for co-sponsoring this series. Uh, as many of you know, our discussions are usually uh, been, have been moderated by Leanne Hirabayashi from the League, and I'm standing in for her tonight. So we've really been grateful uh, for all of their assistance and for everything that they do to support political action in our community. Um, so they're serving people in the Cooperstown area, including the village of Cooperstown, the towns of Otsego, Middlefield, Springfield, and Hartwick, and the surrounding towns in northern Otsego County. Um, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy through education and advocacy. So if you'd like to find out more, you can go to their website. You see that web, web address right um, up at the top there. And um, I guess let me uh, get to the introductions now, starting with my co-host, um, Molly Myers, who many of you may know already. She is the Development Associate for the Fenimore Art Museum and the Farmers Museum and is um, a, a local from Cooperstown and attended Wells College where she studied women's gender studies and First Nations and Indigenous studies. Um, she serves on many boards and many and does a lot of community work, um, including the communities, com the Cooperstown Lions Club, um, the Cooperstown Winter Carnival com Committee, um, and, and she's serving on the Otsego County's Law Enforcement Review Force as well. Um, now moving on to our very distinguished panelists. Um, we are hoping that Tom Heights will be able to join us. I know he's having some uh, difficulties, but he has signed in uh, by phone, so hopefully he'll be joining us. Um, so he currently serves as the Otsego Town Historian. He's a native of Kansas City, Missouri and a Vietnam vet. Um, he is a lifetime member of the NAACP since his teenage days. Um, and as a lawyer in the 90s, he did a lot to promote uh, gender gender rights and transgender rights as well. And, and currently he, he lectures frequently on local history, civil rights and, and gender subjects. Um, our second panelist for today is Ava Folknell, who is the Eugene and Claire Thaw Curator of the American American Indian uh, of American Indian art. She has worked at the with the collection in the Fenimore Art Museum for 20 years. Uh, she has MAs, uh, MA degrees in museum studies and uh, in communication for development from the Cooperstown Graduate Program in Museum Studies and uh, from Malmo University in Sweden. And she's also editor of Art of the American Indians, the Thaw Collection, which is the catalog that accompanies the exhibit when it goes traveling. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Gretchen Sorin, who is the Director and Distinguished Professor of the Cooperstown Graduate Program, SUNY Oneonta. She has more than 30 years of experience as a museum consultant and writes and lectures frequently on issues of African-American history and museum practice. She is the author of a number of books, including Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights and Touring Historic Harlem. 
Um, and our fourth panelist is Francesco Zambello, who serves as the Artistic and General Director of the Glimmerglass Festival and the Artistic Director of the Washington National Opera. She's a graduate of Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, and has received a number of awards and honors. Um, and we are really so thrilled to have all of you for here today uh, for this discussion. So I think I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and, and get ready to turn things over to our first panelist. The order we had, had uh, decided on today was we would start with Tom and then move on to Ava, Gretchen, and then Francesca. Um, Tom, are you here in the... He's over in the participants. So he's in I, participants. Do you is he I under his so. number or did you someone change I, his name? Number, yes. And so I oh I can rename him first too. Ta -da. And then allow to talk. Wonderful. And I'm gonna go ahead and so he'll just need to unmute himself and then he should be able to talk. Tom, are you there? Just muted, so I unfortunately cannot unmute him. I'll just okay. Talk. Tom, can you unmute yourself? Oh, I see him here. Oh, there we go. He's okay, unmuted. I'm unmuted. There he is. All right, welcome, Tom. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, it's been a struggle, but I'm happy to be here finally. Yes, we're thrilled <laughs> to have you. Well, let, just turn things over to you, please. Take it away. Okay, I'll spend a few minutes uh, talking about my particular <clears throat> area of uh, some expertise, which is um, uh, historic markers. And uh, as a history columnist for the Freeman's Journal, uh, there are two uh, stories that I uncovered uh, in the course of compiling my columns <clears throat> and doing research at the uh, Fenimore Library over the years <clears throat> that uh, were stories previously unknown to the uh, church that I belonged to, the First Presbyterian Church, and also stories that were really lost in the, uh, in the early uh, history books or in the, even in the current ones. One involved the emancipation celebration uh, for the liberation of remaining slaves on July 4th, 1827. Uh, there is an account of that in the Freeman's Journal uh, a few days after that event. And uh, <clears throat> that, that particular event is not found in local histories uh, as far as I'm aware. <clears throat> but the account of it is quite specific and uh, detailed. And the other one is uh, the visit of Susan B. Anthony uh, to uh, Cooperstown on February 8th uh, or 9th, I believe it was, 1855, uh, to form a woman's uh, rights committee to advocate for uh, suffrage. Uh, both of those uh, stories were uh, virtually uh, hidden uh, from us until uh, a few years ago. Uh, as a member of the church history team uh, with Katie Boardman and Will Walker, two members of uh, Gretchen's faculty at CGP, who are also members of the church, we uh, contacted the William G. Pomeroy Foundation uh, starting in 2017-18, uh, a few years ago, and began to prepare proposals for historic markers that were being funded by the uh, Pomeroy Foundation. The problem with historic markers is they can tell a story, but it has to be very compact. On these markers, you only have 125 characters, and that's letters, in order to tell the whole story. And it's a virtual, virtually impossible to do that. But you can get enough information on the markers that sometimes leads to conversations with people who are more interested in learning more about it. And, uh, and in that respect, they are useful uh, to, uh, to educate. 
uh, people. Uh, <clears throat> the Emancipation one in particular came as a shock to a number of people who were unaware that slaves had ever existed in Otsego County. Um, and uh, I've had this conversation a number of times, and I've even had conversations with people who are uh, somewhat in denial about it. But the census records are there, and at one time, uh, uh, Mr. Pomeroy, the pharmacist in the early village and a close associate with the Cooper family, as, as he had married one of the daughters, uh, was a member of this church. and. Um, he owned nine slaves at one point. Um, our church building, of course, was built uh, with the help of William Cooper, who donated the land uh, with an understanding that the sanctuary or the building that was built would be available not only for religious services, but for public gatherings, as it would be the largest building. And so in July of 1827, uh, the uh, remaining slaves and also free uh, uh, people of color uh, came and met. And uh, the marker for that reads as follows. On July 4th, 1827, both free and once enslaved people of color celebrated emancipation in New York at this church with speaker Hayden Waters. We don't know a lot about Hayden Waters, but Will Walker has found several uh, references to him as a uh, African-American uh, involved in uh, abolition affairs and, and in the North, particularly as late as uh, the early 1840s. But this was in 1827 and he was the speaker. Um, the term uh, person of, uh, uh, persons of color or people of color was a phrase actually used at that time. I've had people question that. So that is, that is a term that actually appears in the uh, account of this, uh, of this event in 1827. And um, with respect to Susan B. Anthony, um, this was also an undocumented uh, in the histories of Susan's uh, accomplishments and travels. Uh, this particular account was lost uh, until I found it back around 2005 uh, and uh, shared it with the people who were Anthony scholars. Um, we had to prepare extensive um, proposals for the Pomeroy Foundation they have a committee uh, which um, you work with. Uh, they rejected the Anthony one at first, uh, believing that our account was uh, unreliable, but we eventually convinced them that it was actually, uh, that this actually happened. Um, and then they fund the uh, marker uh, through the foundation and the marker costs about $1,000 they deliver the post and they have a foundry in Ohio, which makes up the markers there. They resemble the old New York state markers. Um, I think the, uh, the other thing I want to say is that this is not so much about the church as it was, as it is about these two events. Uh, both of these events occurred here, not because of the church activities, but because of this commitment for public use uh, of the buildings here. And uh, Susan B. Anthony actually did not meet in the church sanctuary, but in a smaller structure in the dead of winter um, after a severe snowstorm. And uh, that building has since disappeared. It was a small barn that they used in the winter months because it could be heated. Uh, better than the larger sanctuary. Um, both of these events took place in that sort of public uh, forum uh, commitment. Uh, the other thing I would just add that is of interest, uh, there was such concern for the liberation of the slaves in July of 1827 that the uh, 
village officials in Cooperstown invited the Union College military cadets to come that day and camp out on what is now the grounds of Bassett Medical Center. Uh, this was a military unit that spent two days marching down here and two days marching back. And they camped out where the hospital now stands. There was no civil disorder, as apparently some had anticipated. And the newspaper account refers to that. Um, the historic markers, I think, are useful because they do introduce people to events that they may not otherwise learn about. Uh, the question is how much more information can you get across to them in more than 125 characters? Um, but at least it does introduce these events in, in that way. And I, I think I should probably conclude at that point. I think my five minutes have passed. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Do we have any questions from the audience, Molly? We haven't had any questions come in yet. So I think we can uh, move on to Ava. And if any questions, um, if anybody out there has any questions for Tom, um, you know, feel free to ask those in the question and answer box and we can um, get to those, those later on. Absolutely. All right, I think we're, uh, we'll move on to our next panelist then, um, Ava Fultonell, and take it away, Ava. Oh, you're muted. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> uh, well, too well trained <laughs> to always keep it on mute. There we go. All right, so thank you to the Friends of Village Library and to the League of Women Voters for inviting me here or the Fandomore Art Museum here to this mm. conversation. And I would also like to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee people on whose ancestral homeland we are on today, or most of us that's attending this seminary. Mm. In, um, mm. in one of the first talks here from the Village Library, Will Walker from CGP did a really nice history of um, slavery or in Cooperstown. And one of the things he mentioned was that by the end of the Revolutionary War, there really wasn't a Native American in Indian presence in the area anymore. So what I was going to do today was talk a little bit about how the Fenimore Art Museum, uh, trying to bring that Native presence back into the history of the region and also in, cont in the contemporary sense with using um, exhibits and contemporary artists um, visiting speakers, et cetera, to bring that presence back onto to the homeland. And also maybe comment on a couple of uh, plaques and historic markers since we've already uh, got the historic markers on the docket here. But um, when the Fenimore first got the, the thought collection of American Indian art um, to their museum in the early 19, 1990s to 1995, when the museum opened up in 1995, um, there was immediately a focus on doing something every other year at least where we do an exhibit and we still do this today, a biennial exhibit of contemporary Haudenosaunee Urquhoy art. It's curated by uh, in a person from, it could be Seneca, Mohawk, um, Oneida, Ondaga, Cayuga, um, and it will have a specific contemporary um, focus. We wanted, there's so much of our collection is historic. So we really want to emphasize this, that Native people are still living here, although in our particular area, um, people really were removed after um, or during and after the Revolutionary War. And we also have, I guess, place names and names for here, like we have the Clinton Sullivan campaign and then were the name Clinton that reminds reminds us of, of some of that history. But anyway, so with exhibits, <clears throat> we have brought, I think we've brought awareness or trying to bring awareness of this to the local, both local to the local um, schools through our programs of fourth, there's a lot of fourth grade local history um, visitation. Uh, we have a site outdoors that has a, a um, replica of a, an Urquhoy longhouse 
from the 1700s, as well as the Seneca log cabin from the late 1700s. Um, and on that space, they try to interpret, they interpret <clears throat> and also show um, what life could have been like in this area at the time or how people live, what could have taken place. The, uh, we, also, we also committed to, um, the, to education within four native um, students. Every other year, we also have something called the Hodne, or the Urk, Dotsigo Institute. Um, and the Otsigo Institute is a week-long seminar for scholars and 12 invited students um, that are selected from all over the country um, based on applications. Uh, when we first started this um, biennial seminar um, 20, about 20 years ago, we would have maybe two to five native students applying to this seminar to come and visit us. Um, Today, the application uh, for that pool for those 12 slots is 60 to 70 students, and um, it, more than half of them are Native students. So that by bringing uh, people, students um, here, as well as the Scott Native scholars uh, for that week, we really have a chance to hear what's going on in Indian country today, um, what the issues are in various parts of the country, um, and for us to do the best we can as a museum to address as many of those issues in the labels we write, in the exhibits we produce. But with that, I have um, kind of taken us far away from Cooperstown. So let's go, let's bring back to Cooperstown. So one of the, um, things we are working on right now or that our board is working on right now is that um, sign up on Esley Avenue, the Indian grave sign that I think everybody is familiar with. It's a beautiful area, beautiful green area up there. But the, um, the sign, the language on the sign might needs a little bit of um, reworking through. And um, the board is working with a man by the name of Doug George, uh, who is Mohawk. He's from originally from Akwesasne, which is a territory up in Northern New York that borders Canada. It's known as Akwesasne or St. Regis. Um, it was one of the areas where the people, it's one of the areas where people from this area was removed to um, after that Clinton Sullivan campaign, the Revolutionary War. Um, he's an active member. He's very involved in issues that deal with the, Urquh the Confederacy, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, and they're working on a, a new language for it, as well as um, we need to, to create some form of event to take place when we change, when we go from this old, older sign to something new that will be, that will be more... Um, well, more sensitive to issues um, that Native people today think is important. So that's why his, his input and the Native community's input is so important. We're also working on um, a land to do some form of land recognition. And this is something I've just started to explore. Um, we want to, at the museum, acknowledge the fact that we are on Haudenosaunee territory, um, traditional homeland of the Haudenosaunee or the Urquhoi people. And how do we do that? Um, we don't just want to write a sign and put the sign up somewhere in a hallway and call it good. You really want to involve the, the what we get, what's around of the local community, the Mohawk, um, Oneida community, um, Haudenosaunee scholars, to, to come up with a way of acknowledging, um, find the right verbiage, um, work in a collaborative way to come up with a statement that um, represents um, the voice, that becomes the voice of the Haudenosaunee and the museum um, that we, and we have established, we have a long established 
um, record of working with the community, as I said, through our exhibits, through education outreach, etc. But anyway, so that's something that we are working on right now, um, trying to address a few things and reinserting um, Native people into this community. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. So one question came in for you. Um, yep. When did the museum start working on redoing the Indian Graves marker and when do they expect to finish? I don't know when they expect to finish. They have started to work on it. Everything because of COVID, of course, have gotten pushed, pushed out and have not gone as fast as it should. Um, we're hoping within, I would say, within a year. Great. At least to have something physical there. We also, we also, of course, want there to be some form of ceremony with with the community. So it it's just things that take time. Sure. And that we have to try to find the right timing for. Sure. Thank you. And one other question came in, um, but we'll save that one for a little bit later on. That one is um, directed at Tom. So I think um, that's great. Thank you so much, Ava. And we can uh, move you, on Ava. to Gretchen. Well, thank you for inviting me um, to speak. I um, had a hard time thinking about what I wanted to say this evening. And I decided that what I would really do is start with a personal story. So in 1974, I was a young um, college student. I was just about to graduate from college. Um, and I was looking for a graduate program in museum studies. And I was, I had grown up in a very diverse neighborhood in New Jersey. And I went to a large urban university, Rutgers University in New Brunswick. And I applied to two graduate programs. One was called the Cooperstown Graduate Program. I had never heard of it before, but my professor said to me, it's the best in the country. You really should go there. Um, and the other program was in Washington, DC. It was at George Washington University. Um, when I told my parents I was headed to Cooperstown, I'd gotten an interview. I can remember exactly what my father said. He said, I don't want you to go there. That's where the Klan is. The Klan is there. And uh, I, I was coming up to Cooperstown with my soon to be husband. We were about to get married. And uh, my husband is, is not African-American. He's white and he's Jewish. And we were terrified. Um, the idea that we were going to a place where the Klan was, um, that this is what my father, was convinced he was he was very afraid for us and so we got in our little red Volkswagen my husband had a little red Volkswagen bug and we drove up to Cooperstown and the students had invited us to stay with them but we chose not to because we were afraid that we didn't we didn't know what to expect when we got to Cooperstown and so we stayed in a hotel we stayed in that little motel that's on uh, Chestnut Street now still there um, and we showed up for um, my interview at the New York State Historical Association Library the next morning. Apparently quite, uh, we shocked everyone because my name at the time was Gretchen Sullivan, which everyone anticipates to be a German Irish girl with red hair, um, and that was not me. Um, and so I had my interview, um, mm -hmm. I was accepted in the program and realized that I was entering a field, the museum profession, which has very few people and had very few people at the time that looked like me. Um, it was a very white field and um, it was a field that was not even thinking very much about the art and culture of um, African-American um, people. Um, but the, the museum field started to change in the 60s and 70s. And they started to be concerned about the fact that there were very few people of color mm. working in the museum field. And I was fortunate enough um, to be able to return to the Cooperstown Graduate Program as the director um, in 1995, I think. <laughs> um, and 
it was a, an interesting position to be in because as the museum field ch changed, the field changed to be more interested in communities, more interested in, in, in the diversity of the nation. Um, and what was really wonderful was that Cooperstown had always been, the Cooperstown graduate program had always been interested in community, had always been interested in people. And we have, I think we have one of, probably one of the most well-documented communities in the United States because of all the oral histories that the CGP students have done since the 1960s. So um, one of our focuses has been to bring more people of color into the museum field. And you may have met some of our uh, graduate students as we have um, brought them to the community and they I think have brought um, a great deal, a diversity of perspectives um, to the program and to all of our other students as well. So museums, this is something that museums are really interested about now. And especially even though they've been talking about it for 20 years, it was really only with the murder of George Floyd this past summer that that a greater urgency came to something that CGP has been doing for more than 20 years. Um, and we like to get our students out into the community. So our students participate in the local churches, they participate, um, they tutor the students in the schools. They um, have done a, a Day of the Dead, Will Walker has done a Day of the Dead program and invited the considerable Latinx community um, in Cooperstown every year. Um, and, and everyone is welcome to participate with us. Um, and our students, we want all of our students, students of color and students um, who are white to learn how to talk to people, how to be with people, how to associate with people who are different from them. And I think that's um, one of the goals of our program. And it, it certainly is, it is a struggle in Cooperstown, um, but our, we do have our students working with the Refugee Center in Utica as well. Um, and I will also say it's not only a struggle in Cooperstown, but it's a struggle for those of us who have children who have gone through the Cooperstown school system. So um, I will leave my five minutes at that. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you. Um, no questions for the Oh, I think Molly has frozen on us. Oh. But I think what she was going to say is that we don't yet have questions. I think there's one question that we'll save up for the end for Tom. Um, mm -hmm. But I think maybe what we'll do is, is, is move on to our final panelists. And then I think we'll be able to really open it up for a discussion between all of, all of the panelists. Um, so I'm going to move on to Francesca Zambello when I can figure out how to change my spotlight. There we go. All right. Thank you, Francesca. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. And uh, it's great to virtually, I hope, see a lot of the attendees and very happy to be with this uh, esteemed group of panelists uh, and hearing everybody talk about things from the community to the history to personal stories. Um, that's been one of the things that I've loved the most about the time that I've been here. Uh, has been really connecting to this incredible community. So um, I think each of our perspectives on how we, uh, I think, address race in this area is so different. And that to me is fascinating because even for a small place, everyone has a different approach. Um, my approach was I, I was hired to run the festival. This was my 10th season actually. And when I began uh, 10 years ago, I, I was quite uh, surprised uh, when I first came here, how there was no diversity uh, in the landscape. And actually the world of opera is fairly diverse uh, in terms of performers. We've Historically, particularly since uh, Marian Anderson broke the color barrier, there have been many artists of color, in, opera singers. And so I made a, a decision at that point to, the, to make the company a third people of color. And if you've attended performances, perhaps you've noticed that. But uh, at that time, my 
uh, partner here, uh, the executive director was uh, Linda Jackson, an African-American woman who also went to Rutgers, I'm sure, Gretchen. Um, you, you obviously know that, and I know you know each other, but she is no longer here, has been replaced by somebody else. But uh, my plan was that, that we would hire 30% young artists of color and guest artists of color which we immediately started doing in the first years. And that was uh, a mandate that I gave to my staff. I said, this is what we have to do. This is, you know, we have to represent America in all the works that we perform. And that's been pretty true for the last 10 years in the casting uh, on stage and what you see. It has not been as true for us in the uh, staffing because it is difficult to entice administrators, particularly of color, to come here. And we have done okay with that, but we could do better and we are working to do better now. So I'm proud about the track record that we've had and it certainly has garnered a lot of interest uh, in our field, in the field of opera. Glimmer Glass is rated as number one in diversity of all opera companies uh, by Opera America. And that's, uh, there are about 250 opera companies actually in America. Um, before the pandemic and the season before, we produced the opera Blue, um, which uh, was uh, a piece, if you didn't see it, was uh, about a black family. The father was a police officer and their son uh, was uh, a really a young man who was on a political quest and he was ended up being killed in a rally by a white police officer. Uh, this happened before George Floyd. And the work got incredible acclaim uh, here and then was going on to about 10 other theaters when COVID hit. It won the prize for the best uh, new work uh, last year. And so I, I feel like we have tried to do a lot uh, to address these issues through the arts, because I believe first and foremost, the arts are a bridge, a way mm -hmm. to create communication between people. This has not always been easy. Uh, and uh, there have been um, many wonderful experiences for many artists, but there have also been many very, very difficult experiences. And we have had to intervene a number of times where there have been people subjected to incredible racist uh, events, but there have also been some very beautiful ones. Um, I'll just share two and... Uh, um, Two years ago, uh, a black artist was walking on a street in Cooperstown, uh, a black man, and he was big. It wasn't Eric Owens, but it was another large man. Eric Owens is a very big, very famous black opera singer um, who has been stopped and frisked at a Stewart's here. But um, this was another man, and this was at 10 o'clock in the morning. He was standing on a street in Cooperstown. A guy pulled over in his car and said, what the hell are you doing on this street? And he said, well, I'm actually living in this house right here uh, for the summer and I'm working here. And the guy said, you have no business being here. What the hell are you doing? And then con continued to use the N word and berate this, uh, berate this man who he then, this gentleman called me immediately. And he said, this is what's happened to me. I just, I don't know if I can be here. So I called immediately. And then I ran to Ellen Tillipaw's office, who, the mayor. And I said, this has got to stop in Cooperstown. This has got to stop. And I said, you have to create a message in the community that is public. And I felt it a small victory that then the town put up a sign, uh, which you'll notice when you're coming into town on the golf course, it says, I think Cooperstown welcomes all people. That doesn't mean that it's actually true, but at least it says it there. But then the flip side, um, there was a beautiful, a very beautiful story a couple of years ago where some black artists were not being served at a restaurant in Cherry Valley. And so they went out into the country, which I don't think was the best idea, but they ended up at a rural bar um, <laughs> in very rural bar uh, on some back road. And they got out of the car, they, they went in and they realized it was, it was scary, like scary looking. And they turned around. The owner ran out and said, hey, don't go anywhere. Come on, come on in. You know, I've got food, I've got drink. 
And it turned, it became this sort of black hangout for a summer because the gentleman who ran this bar really in the middle of nowhere um, created this incredible black night culture uh, and was very warm and welcoming. And uh, so, you know, there's all sides of, of the story here. And I, I feel mm -hmm. proud about the work we've done, but I think that there's much, much more to do. And uh, mm -hmm. to further that commitment at Glimmerglass, we've made a big commitment. We've hired a, a staff person who is now our EDI officer. Um, we've received funding to help build particularly training for interns and administrators uh, different than our young artist program. And so that's that's kind of where we are right now. And I'm, I'm grateful to the many people in the area who have come to me and have been very positive and supportive. And, and those who haven't been, I feel like at least we're opening the doors for communication in whatever ways we possibly can. So, period, end of paragraph. <laughs> thank you, Francesca, that was great. Um, thank you to all of our panels. I think you've, you've all brought up some great points and some great stories. And I, I know I have a lot of questions myself, but I think I see that we have um, several questions that have piled up in our, our Q&A. So I think I'll let Molly take over and, and maybe try to- Yes, and hopefully I don't freeze again. Um, <laughs> first, um, one, for um, Francesca. Um, this person says, my husband who is black had no interest in opera or art museums. We went to the gospel hours and he saw blue and he loved it and felt welcome. Harder not to crack was the art museum, but after a tour of Thaw, he was hooked. How to spread the word? <laughs> well, I think those are the <laughs> questions that we ask all the time is how to spread the word about everything that each of us are doing uh, in, in, in all that we are doing. Um, uh, I should have also said, aside from our regular operas, we have had a gospel series every year for the last several years, which has sold out and been incredibly popular. Uh, so I'm glad the, that that woman, that your husband came, I'm glad he liked it. I'm glad that he found Blue Great Theater. And all I can say is spread the word and keep coming back. I mean, we do a, a fair amount of outreach. Uh, we used to at Lynn, we will continue to after COVID. Um, to communities where we find people of color. Uh, we have particularly have had a lot of help from Utica where we have been working with different organizations, especially to bring in young kids. We had a whole training and educational program for kids and there were many kids of color in that uh, when that was going successfully for about five years. So all we need to do is is keep spreading the word and keep creating welcome. It's all about it's all about welcoming people. You know, it's all about that people feel that they can come here, that they don't feel like Gretchen said when you know day one it was like where's the clan, um, and I think that's incumbent on the community to reach out. I mean, we have also reached out like even in the hospital there are many many people, there are many BIPOC people working there, and so. Glimmerglass, we were going into the hospital to try and entice them to come. And we were doing like cocktail evenings and everything for them. So it's just, it's about creating, putting your hand out. And one other question that kind of goes hand in hand with that, and this is, um, this was directed at Gretchen and Francesca. Um, how can individuals help the community welcome artists and students of color? What more can be done? Gretchen, go ahead. I was going to say, um, when our students of color, when we have students of color, we encourage them to, you know, to get out and to join, join organizations, to join clubs. To, I think whenever there's an event, you know, you can invite students to come and participate, and they will. Um, they're mm -hmm. happy to, you know, go to potluck suppers, to go to um, lectures and evening events. They're they're looking for things to do. There's not a lot to do in Cooperstown, especially in the winter. Um, and they, they, they do participate in, in the winter carnival. That's something that's, you know, for young people, that's great. But, you know, the CGP students constitute, I would say probably the largest number of, of people in that age group, that group of, you know, late twenties, early thirties, they're, uh, they're available, uh, 
you know, if, if there's a Jewish family, sometimes we've had, had students that are really looking for a place to go to a Seder. Um, and, and inviting a student to a Seder would be a, a wonderful way to um, engage some of our, our students. But we have events at the graduate program too, and we'd love more community. We'd love to have more community involvement at the graduate program. Uh, I agree with you, Gretchen, completely. Uh, I mean, pre-COVID, our annual staff was 35. And of that, um, about half of them are in the same age group uh, as the graduate program. And I know there's a lot of uh, cross-fertilization and socializing there between those two groups. But uh, particularly in the summer, you know, when we, you know, when interns start arriving, basically from April on, I honestly think it's sometimes just a matter of like, you see somebody in a store and you say, hello, welcome. I hope you're enjoying Cooperstown. Can I direct you to something? Do you like blah, blah, blah? You know, engaging in conversation, making people feel welcome. Uh, and th that's, that's truly one of the most important things. Uh, you know, you see people in a restaurant, go up and say, hey, are you performing at the festival? I'm so excited you're here, you're working there. You know, just, ice breaking with people, I think is is one of the biggest, biggest things. And once you get going in a conversation, hopefully, you know, it can lead to something else. That's great. Um, Namita, there's lots of other questions, but I don't know if we want to save some of these for the end discussion after we do some of the more general questions. Some, some of these questions I think might be answered um, as the panelists kind of interact with each other. Sure, do you wanna just... Um... Start with one of, what do you think is a good one to? I don't have them up in front of me, unfortunately. Oh, you don't have them in front of me. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you, I totally thought you did. Um, all right. Well, I see a couple of questions about the, asking about the history of the clan in Cooperstown. I see um, to, to directed towards Gretchen and also, so I guess this is something that people have interest in. in. Um, if anybody has anything that they want to add. I guess no, I they... don't think I don't think the clan has had a stronghold in Cooperstown. I think that what my father was referring to, the, the clan was enormous in the southern tier. It was um, headquartered in Binghamton. Um, and there were clan members, um, large numbers of, of the clan in Bingham in and around Binghamton and Johnson City, that area. I do think that <clears throat> Uh, people are are put off by the number of um, Confederate so Confederate flags and Confederate signs that one sees as you're driving to Cooperstown. <clears throat> I was asked recently why uh, by the by the Adirondack Museum why African Americans don't go to the Adirondacks and and um, my dean at Oneonta had said he had, he's a, a environmental geographer and he said he had gone up to the Adirondacks and it was house after house after house of Confederate flags. Um, and that doesn't give you, um, doesn't make you feel comfortable. That doesn't make there you was, feel welcome. If, if I may add uh, <clears throat> to the question on the Klan, uh, there was an incident in uh, the Fly Creek Methodist Church uh, in which local Klan members from somewhere in Otsego County dressed in robes um, reacting apparently to sermons given by the preacher in that church uh, at another time, took over the church one Sunday, uh, held the uh, pastor and the congregation essentially hostage for several hours and um, terrorized them. And this was in the 1920s. The Klan was strongest in this area uh, at that time, and uh, and throughout central New York, and in Oneonta, and, um, wasn't there a but, Klan rally in, in Oneonta? Yes, and Oneonta has a similar uh, Klan history, but it's it's largely confined to that period in the 1920s. And uh, the Klan, uh, the people running the Klan in New York, turned out to be uh, embezzlers. And they, they simply were milking the, their membership for money and, and so on. And eventually that caught up with them. And, and according to the resources I have, which are not extensive or definitive, uh, they died out in, in the 1930s. 
We did have an incident in Cooperstown that I found in the newspaper some years ago, but it appears to have been a prank, not an actual Klan member, but someone simply uh, imitating the Klan or using a, a Klan symbol as a as a prank uh, sort of thing. Um, so it does, I, there is a there is a history here, but not perhaps that significant. Right. I I, I think. Um, if I could just jump in here, I, I think uh, I think the history of all this is fascinating. But uh, but I do think uh, somebody's put it in a question, and I and I think it would be uh, great for us to talk about is how to make change now, because I think uh, that is what we really need to address. Um, I know that mm -hmm. there has is a group that's been formed. Um, we have a representative called the Inclusion Cons Consortium. Um, which is about creating, and you can find it. I know uh, somebody's just put up, Molly's going to answer about that in a minute. But I do think for people who are listening or watching, I think, you know, the most important thing to create diversity in our community um, is economic. You know, it's like hiring, uh, bringing people here. Uh, you know, uh, if somebody is running a business and they're a person of color, frequent them, tell other people about it. Um, you know, it's not just like we can like sort of, you know, put it on Facebook, like come on up here and live. Um, hmm. it, it's like how to make things available and accessible to people, students of color who are in Oneonta, you know, helping, you know, helping them into our community, let's say finding a job here, whether, you know, it's a service job or a more important job, you know, that is, that is the thing that will change the composite of the community the quickest will be to engage people with you know, an economic life in this community uh, and to give people a reason to live here. Um, so mm -hmm. if you have any access in terms of hiring of any of the people who are watching, that's the way to make change uh, and mm -hmm. to then you know, use uh, and to connect them to other people in the community. I think uh, everyone mm -hmm. certainly who's probably watching this is, uh, is pro what we're all saying, but but I think that's the biggest thing: how to affect change uh, here. And I'm, sh you know, welcome other people's ideas about all of that because that that is what will change it. Absolutely. And there's a question um, specifically about: uh, are there policies or initiatives through the arts or otherwise um, that? Mm -hmm that people have found through their studies that a locality can adopt to better attract people or families of color to make communities like Cooperstown mm -hmm. a more attractive place to set down roots. So policies or initiatives, can anybody think of specifics that, that might be helpful? Yes, the school curriculum. The school curriculum has to include people of color in the, in the things that, that they're doing. And I know that uh, Rebecca Cialo at the high school is uh, who teaches English, junior English, is working um, to try and do that, to make um, sure that, that students are reading about um, people of all, you know, Americans, you know, the diversity of the American um, experience. Um, but it, it really needs to be part of the schools. People need to feel that their children will not be harassed in the school system. And there needs to be special, special programs, trainings that really train kids to, or at least teach kids how to be respectful to people of diverse backgrounds. And that, that doesn't always happen, but it's really important to parents. Agreed. Um, I think other, uh, Molly, do you see other questions that are jumping at you? I see a few that we could maybe uh, combine. There is some questions about um, the, the Native American sign that, that you mentioned earlier, Ava. And I think there's a couple questions. Um, one is for, for Tom and Ava, how you think that the Clinton Sullivan signage can be changed to include native perspectives. And then another question um, uh, is also mentions the poem that's at the Gray site and how it's an example of, of cultural appropriation, but that it's sort of a historical artifact in itself at mm -hmm. this point and whether the text of that poem mm -hmm. will be preserved. Uh, when that when that marker is is revised, I might um, I might just make a comment about that. One of the problems with historic markers is that over time the use of language 
and how it is understood and received culturally will change. And in some of our older historic markers, that's quite evident. So what they saw at the time as being a a correct, a politically, culturally correct way of phrasing history after another 50 years becomes obsolete in some way. Uh, we have another marker at our church, which uh, was put in in the 1950s under a New York State program that describes our church as the oldest church in Cooperstown, as though that is of great significance. Well, it's not the oldest church, actually. The Episcopal Church had a worshiping community well before the Presbyterians got together and built a building with the help of William Cooper. So that's an example of an historic marker which actually needs to be revised, but it's it's on the church lawn as well as Susan B. Anthony and, and uh, the uh, emancipation one. So over time, these markers can acquire um, some baggage, so to speak, as we learn more about history or our, our present views of things changes. Okay, I'll make a comment on that too. That's also, of course, why it's taking us a little time to discuss the sign that we are replacing on Esli Ave, is to include and ask, ask to get an input on what it is that should be, be up on this new sign. Um, maybe we can incorporate, maybe there's a way of incorporating the historic version by um, something you can log on to and see the depth of history at the particular place, etc. And I also saw there was a uh, question about the Clinton Sullivan signage um, or remnants that we have of the Clinton Sullivan campaign. I would say the first, uh, and or if it can be changed to include native. Uh, Mm -hmm. The question popped away, but if it could be included to um, with a native uh, point of view, I think maybe the question was. Um, I would say, well, we had an exhibit actually at the museum maybe 15 years ago now that was contemporary native artists addressing the Clinton Sullivan campaign and what it had done to native communities in this area. We actually have a one or two pieces of art in the collection from that. So I would say if we're looking to, to how to change the sign and sign, sign verbiage, um, et cetera, would be to, re of course, to reach out to the native communities and form a group um, or you form a group and try to extract what people want, how people want to be represented, what kind of verbiage they want, how to be re represented through um, or visually. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Um, there is another question um, in here for Ava, Gretchen, and Francesca. Um, how do we, as a primarily white community, authentically represent non white culture and history authentically? And what can we do better? <laughs> kind of a big one. <laughs> Great question. Uh, you know, I think, um, I, I don't think you, you have to be, you know, I'll, I'll just take what I do. I don't think you have to be black to do African American history, but I do think that you do have to consult mm -hmm. people who are African American. I do think you have to take um, into consideration um, the, the perspectives um, that, that people who are a part of that community bring to that study. Um, and, and so mm -hmm. whenever I'm doing an exhibition, um, not only, you know, even though I'm African American, it doesn't mean that I represent all African Americans or or all African American communities, I would consult people within that community. Um, if I'm if I was doing an exhibition on Buffalo or you know another part of New York State, I would consult people within that community um, mm -hmm. about their history, about their stories, and I think that's true for mm -hmm. any um, any curator or anyone who is doing um, history or or um, Culture and I, I think it, you know in, in our schools we need to bring authors in poets mm -hmm. authors people who who write um, and I also think it's important so important to have role models so one of the things mm -hmm. that we do at the graduate program is uh, we bring in a lot of diverse speakers 
to talk to all of our students. Many of our students are um, white women from the Midwest. That seems to be kind of a standard group that goes into museum work. And um, they have not had the experience of working with people who are Jewish or people who um, are African-American or Latinx or um, a, a variety of other, of other backgrounds. And so we bring those people into the program to teach um, and teach our students um, about their personal experiences, as well as to show them that these people are competent scholars. Yeah, I would totally agree with you, Gretchen. And, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, education is such a huge part of it. And that just doesn't mean kids. I mean, for example, the library could be running a speaker series where they are bringing in uh, a, a spectrum of BIPOC writers uh, to talk. Um, somebody put up in the chat that they love that we brought ta Coates to our literary series, Glimmer, that we were doing a big literary series. You know, we had Margaret Atwood and obviously RBG all the time. And, um, and so uh, the library is a prime place. You know, we expect that the library is going to bring us that. And I think education and creating platforms for discussion for people so that, you know, you know, you assign people to read a book and then the, the author comes and you talk about it. And it, and it really, it, I think it, it's a great way to open people's eyes and to educate them. So that to me is just a, a simple step, but one that I think is very effective in a, in a community like this. Um, because people in this community, you know, things, things do reach out, they do broaden out, but it, it has to change from within. And obviously, of course, Maybe. school. I mean, we are uh, Glimmer Glasses big on schools and big on bringing music to schools and engaging uh, kids to think about music, uh, to think about culture and history and the world around them through music. So it's that thing mm -hmm. of, you know, whether we're using literature or art or uh, to make people think differently about ideas. And, and that's, again, I just, I think it's always about education and economics. May, may I add something to that? Um, <clears throat> Francesca and the opera have provided uh, wonderful music within our church sanctuary. I, I don't want to sound like a, like a commercial for churches or even my church. I'm just saying, we have had the pleasure of soloists from the opera of all races uh, at times. Uh, and again, this is an opera, uh, one of the virtues of having the opera. Uh, we've also um, uh, have an affiliate member who is a hip hop gospel artist uh, named LaDonna Clark, African-American. Uh, she actually drives a truck to make a living but Moonlights as a hip hop uh, gospel pastor and uh, is a singer of, of uh, some note in the hip hop culture. Um, and so all of these um, institutions, whether they be secular, religious or educational are places where these contacts can be um, increased and, and can contribute to a better understanding of what the larger culture and history uh, is of not just the local area, but the United States. Great. Um, there's one other question. Uh, this is for everyone. Do, uh, does anyone have any ideas for how the museum, CGP and opera could collaborate telling the story of slavery and emancipation in Cooperstown? Hmm. Could you state that again? Sure. Um, do any of you have ideas for how the museum, CGP, and opera could collaborate telling the story of slavery and emancipation in Cooperstown? Hmm. Uh, like all things, you know, we we uh, we focus on certain issues and uh, and uh, you know do a piece about them, which is you know, probably one of the, the best ways to co-collaborate on something like that. Um, we're even, uh, you know, we haven't announced our season yet, but we are 
there's a, a big issue in mm -hmm. one of the pieces that we're doing this summer, you know, pray to God we're doing mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so I certainly think it would be interesting to consider a collaboration on this, uh, you know, oh. as, as, as going forward, I think, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's important to keep history in perspective, but I also think it's really important to focus on contemporary issues. And mm -hmm. emancipation is important, uh, of course, it, as is history, but I just find so often that helping people mm -hmm. think forward about how to put things into their own lives today, you know, might be a way, you know, if there's a way to do something historical and contemporary at the same time. With, with Will Walker's help, uh, we had Ibram X. Kendi, the author of uh, The Definitive uh, History of Racism in America, uh, who is frequently on television these days. Uh, he was a former SUNY professor and colleague of Will's. Um, we sponsored his lecture several years ago. And, um, I, and we've also... Um, been teaching in the Center for Continuing Adult Learning, which is a program um, associated with SUNY Oneonta for senior adults. Uh, we've had several uh, number of uh, classes taught uh, there uh, that are um, <clears throat> on racial history and uh, subjects. Well, there's a, a, a master's thesis uh, in the Nisha Library, in the, uh, uh, what's it called now? Fenimore Art Museum Library. Um, right. On, uh, written by uh, Sylvia Hollis, I think, um, on yes. the history of African Americans in Cooperstown. Uh, I don't, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't sound like an exhibition is the right, right uh, format because there's just not, there, there are no objects <clears throat> to put in an exhibition. But it certainly sounds like something that could be part of a lecture series or a series of programs. One of the uh, famous uh, African American women, perhaps the most famous American African American woman of the early uh, 19th century, was Betsy Stockton. Uh, she was raised uh, in a family uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, or near there, and. Uh, actually was a resident with the family she worked for in Cooperstown in the year 1827. We haven't been able to establish that she attended the emancipation celebration, but she was a member of that family and a friend of Frederick Douglass's. Um, she died shortly uh, uh, after Lincoln's uh, Emancipation Proclamation in 1865. Uh, she was an early missionary to uh, Hawaii with a group of white people and was the first African-American woman <clears throat> to uh, serve as a, as a foreign missionary in the missionary service. She spent about two years here with a family that she was uh, associated with. You know, I'm going to jump on, on Francesca's uh, comment about the present. I. I've had um, several students of color, male students of color, who've had issues with the police in Cooperstown. So I would say that um, since there's a new commission, I think, to deal with mm -hmm. you know, police community relations or something like that, I, you know, that's the kind of thing that um, for, yeah. for the folks that are part of the opera in the summertime who mm -hmm. feel uncomfortable walking down Main Street, um, or for my graduate students who are living in Cooperstown and feel uncomfortable, um, you know, that's something that we could uh, and should start to deal with. Um, do you remember, uh, Gretchen, do you remember Tara? Oh, she I, was stopped. A, a traffic ticket every night. Yeah, she, I, I, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's another example of uh, young, you know, the police uh, situation here. Right. I, I, that's what I mean. I just think it's really important to focus on contemporary action. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I see a question about from Nancy Potter about changing the school mascot from the Redskins. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that should be like happening now, today, immediately. Yeah. 
immediately these things should be being addressed and kids should be taught why it's important um, yeah. and what it means. And of course, you can't erase history. You have to explain history so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, mm -hmm. And so changing something like that, that's an obvious wonderful thing. Um, and then I see there was something uh, from somebody about uh, a culture day at school. We'll, as soon as we're back, we'll continue that tradition. We've always had it and we will continue it. And that's one of the reasons that one of our big programs has been uh, a youth. We've been doing a youth opera every year, um, which, you know, is a way of engaging. You know, we've had 30 to 50 kids uh, between the ages of six and 16 every summer working at the opera. Uh, and one of the great things I've always thought was that these kids, which are usually 95% white, are in contact with so many young people of color who are, you know, performers in their 20s. And so that it gives them a world that they don't see necessarily around them. Again, uh, again, creating an important kind of uh, resource or tapestry or experience for them. So again, these are all things that are, uh, I think, contemporary action, which I hope that people can reflect on and everyone can find their own way of expressing these things. Um, could you speak to the deer slayer as a new mascot? Do we go far enough in choosing that? I'm unsure what to think. Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, you know, he's like a half naked uh, Native American out there with the, you know, I mean, uh, no, it's not appropriate. <laughs> of course, it's not appropriate. Um, uh, and that's not to say what, I mean, in my opinion, this is in my humble opinion. Um, mm. But I do think we should understand the works of Cooper. We should understand the Cooper. We should also understand, uh, oh God, what's the Cooper, the female who was the writer, um, who wrote Rural Hours. You know, w w she had a lot of great things to say and write about. We don't necessarily think about her, but yeah, I, again, don't erase history, embrace history, understand it, and then build on top of it in a way that would be constructive. Mm. So, um, Francesca, going off of that, I'm going to shut up now. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm... <laughs> no, but based on what you're talking about, um, build off it, don't erase it. There's a question in here related to that. Um, so, the Esley sign, uh, they're talking about how it's a patronizing statement made, it was made in a time by those with power over those without it at that time. Is it wise to erase that fact even as you try to tell the rest of the story? Um, mm. In a way, the poem is a mirror held up to ourselves. So I'm wondering what people think about that. Hmm. I think um, I think um, I was trying to address that a little bit maybe before, but maybe not so directly head on. But there is a way of telling almost the history of history, right? Um, uh, uh, we need to shape something new but we also need to reflect on these things that went before, what this new comes out of, of what, what it is that we are responding to. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, that's part of, of the discussion that we're having mm -hmm. about, because obviously that it, today that it's not okay. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's, in, it's important for us to kind of know what it is that has gone before that we now need to move away from where we need, mm. we don't need that white voice. We need the indigenous, the native voice to talk about mm. it. Um, so I think those different processes, it's, it's important to record the processes as well and that make them part of the story. Mm. At least that's my personal. I think every um, generation has some blind spots and uh, I constantly worry in my history research for columns in the uh, local newspapers, uh, what the blind spots of the present really are. Um, I encounter these uh, constantly in the papers uh, <clears throat> as I go back through the Freeman's Journal decades all the way back to the 18, early 1800s. Each generation seems to have uh, blind spots and 
practices that we would never contemplate today. And as our culture and technology and things develop, some of these are revealed um, and put in a very different light. And I could cite numerous examples of that. But um, the what we see today as important uh, may not be so important in generations to come. And there may be things that we're missing now that in 20 to 40 or 50 years uh, may become significant in ways that we would never have imagined. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm looking at the, the other questions that we have. Um, and I think um, before we move on, just speaking on the, the, the issue of, of history, I just wanted, I just received the reminder that um, if you take a look at the Friends of the Library website um, at the anti-racism resources page, there is a link there to um, some of Will Walker students' research on slavery in Cooperstown. So there is that history out there um, of, of, of what went on in this community. Um, and I'll also add that someone else um, brought up that an important resource for the local schools and libraries is the History Makers Archive. Um, that is the nation's largest collection of video interviews with African American leaders in all sectors, um, from science to sports, mm. from dance to philosophy. Um, and also, the village of Cooperstown is possibly taking up the eight can't eight can't wait list of basic principles for police conduct. Um, That's fantastic. Um, yeah. And I just also want to point out that we have um, in two weeks, February 10th, um, we have another Friends of the Village Library panel on law enforcement where we'll have um, Sheriff Devlin, our um, police chief of Cooperstown, uh, Frank Cavalieri, um, Mayor Tillapaw, and also um, uh, Joe Popkin, who is uh, one of the head people at the Rockefeller Institute and writes policy mm -hmm. for the governor as well for law enforcement. Um, so that's going to be a great panel where we're going to be, um, you know, addressing law enforcement. So that's coming up soon. So <clears throat> coming down. soon. No, there is some movement in some cities now to um, not have armed officers involved in traffic stops. That there, there is <clears throat> no need if someone has a, a burned out uh, headlight or a broken tail light. Um, there's no need for somebody with a gun to be approaching them. Um, it, it really, it, it, there's only a need for somebody to give them a ticket or to just give them a warning. And, you know, that, that's mm -hmm. very creative thinking, I think, about um, how law enforcement uh, can interact in a more positive way with the public, that the mm -hmm. traffic stops do not require guns and shooting. Absolutely. I would agree with that. Well, I've got, I've actually got a question um, that I've been that I've been sitting on for a while, and I really I think it's for all of our panelists. But something that you said, Francesca, brought this to mind, and I think Tom, when we had a conversation earlier, um, this was something that also came up, and that's the idea of resistance to some of these efforts. Um, so, Tom, I remember when we had a conversation earlier, and you talked about your efforts to sort of get these plaques established, that there was some pushback against that. Um, and then Francesca and your efforts to hire diversity, uh, I imagine that there are times when you also receive some pushback or some people challenge that, that decision. So I'm wondering for any for many of our panelists, um, what thoughts you have on that, how to address resistance so that we're not just preaching to the choir when it comes to actually you know, creating change and, and affecting uh, change in our community. I think change is, comes in very small steps. And, but they mm. have to be always forward moving. And I, I take it as my sort of personal mantra mm. to try and change one person at a time. Um, mm. And I know MLK said something like that. And I, and I do think that that's, you know, mm. of course I meet a ton of resistance. The comments <clears throat> that I get from people and the, you know, mm. or a donor who complains because we do something like that or, or somebody writes me a letter and say, why did you cast uh, a black person in that role? It shouldn't be that way. I mean, the shouldn't be. So I, I take it as one step at a time and I, and I am grateful for things like 
I have a staff member who is a strong believer in caring arms and who hmm. said to me recently, you know, you really helped me understand that gay people are just like all of us. And I like a lot hmm. of gay people now. I know hmm. we're not talking about uh, gay issues here, but I was like, okay, I'm glad that I changed you about that. Um, hmm. And another staff member who told me uh, that he had started out being racist. And now he said, I have as many black friends now who you introduced me to over these years. And if somebody bothers them, I'm going to get my gun and go. And I was like, stop right there. Stop right there. <laughs> you were doing so well. And now, so, so I, I guess I just, in, I think resistance, you have to, you know, meet with dialogue and meet <laughs> with discussion and hopefully talk people down. And it's just like, I knocked on somebody's door the other day because I'd had it with their Confederate flag that was near our home. And I had a <laughs> long conversation with them and they didn't take it down, but they really engaged in a constructive conversation with me. And I bet if I go back mm. again, that maybe it'll come down. Mm. Mm. The pushback uh, that I have is largely related to uh, items in my history columns in the Freeman's Journal in the hometown Oneonta. <clears throat> and from time to time, um, I, uh, within 125 to 250 words uh, at an interval of 100 years or 150 years, I will reflect, uh, I will tell a story that is reveals the prejudices of that era and the treatment of people differently. And uh, occasionally uh, the Freeman's Journal uh, receives complaints. Um, <clears throat> some of the history columns that run in other newspapers are all good news. They always avoid anything controversial. The Freeman's Journal <clears throat> column that I've written for many years uh, has never taken that approach. And since the this news comes exactly out of the paper itself, uh, it really reveals where the paper was 150 or 175 years ago. It's one of the oldest uh, existing daily, uh, weekly papers in the country. So there is a way of alerting people to these ideas and give them some measure of how things have changed, but they also reveal how things may not have changed so much. And, um, and so I think that's the value of bringing that history to light in the present. Um, it doesn't always hit people the same way. And um, I've, I've had to, uh, I've been called to account a number of times for things that people found quite objectionable. Um, there was a time in 1935 uh, when uh, Red Bercy, a, a very well-regarded uh, physical education teacher, uh, put on a pageant in which all the uh, senior high students were basically dyed red and then put on an Indian, an American Indian pageant for the entertainment of not only the school population, but the, but the village. And um, this apparently was a, was his reaction to being called red, which was his nickname. Uh, of course he had red hair um, but the students literally were dyed with red dye. And uh, in research that we were asked to do for the uh, Redskins controversy, um, this apparently the first time the, the name Redskins showed up in the paper was in 1935-36. And uh, it may have had something to do with that uh, with that pageant at the high school. So that's an example of something that we find quite odd, objectionable, and even weird. But for that time, 
It was not. <laughs> and this is what I this is why I say that was a blind spot in a sense, uh, as we see it now. I think I think that's a great point, and I think I think that's I think that's a good place for us to maybe end that that idea that standards need to change sometimes, and what we think is okay now is mm. is is not always okay, and that sometimes in hindsight um, we can we can look back and and mm -hmm. and and think yeah. about what does need to change. And I think our focus now is on what's going on in our own community and and the sorts of changes that we need to think about now, so that we're not looking back in 20 years and having those same. Yeah kinds of thoughts, but really from from a lot of the discussions today and from some of our other panels that we've had, what's really come out to me is how much a lot of this is based on individual experiences and how addressing mm -hmm. these things comes up on an individual level, but also in terms of people of color who come to this area, whether they're visitors or whether they're residents here, um, that it really just takes one positive or negative experience for, for that mm -hmm. to sort of shape their, their impression of this of this community. And I think a lot of the stories that, that the panelists today have told us um, and some of our other um, our, our other panels discussions as well, this has also come out. So I think that's something for all of us, I think to think about as we move forward with this project um, of, of looking at our community, of, of thinking about those individual experiences and our own responses uh, that we have to these things. Um, but I think we know we're at 8.30 right now. I think we could probably go on for hours with this topic, but I think we're gonna have to shut ourselves down uh, to, so everyone can, can get back to their, <laughs> to their lives. So I'm gonna pull up my remaining, uh, my remaining slides um, and just make a few closing remarks before we end for the evening. Um, I really would like to start off by just thanking uh, my co-host Molly Myers and all of our panelists today, Tom, Ava, uh, Gretchen, and Francesca. This was a, a terrific session. We were so thrilled that you could all join us today. Um, so this is really, there's also a, a dedicated community that's been working both in front of and behind the scenes who have made this series a reality. So I'd like to thank uh, Carrie Fortes, Joanne Gardner, Emily Gibson, Nancy Herman, Dottie Hudson, Karen Katz, Lynn Mabist, Molly Myers, Candace Shannon, Callie Wright, and me. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Leanne Hirabayashi for all of the hard work that she's been putting in to help us organize these panels and generally all the work that she's been doing to moderate them. Um, and of course, none of this would have been possible without the wholehearted support of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown Board and the Village Library Board as well. Um, lastly, let me just tell everyone what's coming up next. Uh, so on Wednesday, February 10th, We've got our next Looking in the Mirror uh, panel discussion that Molly mentioned earlier that's talking, taking a look at racism and law enforcement. On Sunday, February 21st, we'll have our Sunday speaker series presenting a panel discussion with local artists and they'll be talking about the legacy of women artists in Otsego County. Um, in March, our Sunday speaker series will host Tim Johnson, who is the CEO of Otsego Electric, who will be talking about the struggle to establish broadband in rural America, which is definitely, I think, something that hits close to home, home, close to home for many of us. Um, and then our final look in the mirror, looking in the mirror, mirror series will take place in March, and it's sort of going to be a, a final wrap up um, and a look at some of the next steps that we're planning to take uh, with this initiative. And those dates we will announce. Soon, I'd just like to mention that our Sunday speakers uh, programs are scheduled for three o'clock on Zoom and our Looking in the Mirror series will be starting at seven o'clock as they did today. And both of these programs are free, open to the public, um, and you can go to Eventbrite. I think that link you can see up right there at the top and you can uh, just click on that link to register for any of these programs. If you have any email, uh, any questions or comments at all, feel free to email us. You can see our FOVL email address right up there on the screen. And that really concludes our program for the evening. Once again, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. We're really so thrilled that you could join us today. And, and it's really been a, a really fantastic discussion. Um, thank you to all of our, our attendees as well for joining us this evening, and we hope to see you on February 10th. So take care, stay safe, and good night. Thank you, Namita. Thank you, everyone.